All right. Greetings, everyone. I'm Michael Quinn Patton, coming to you from the North Woods of Minnesota. We have participants today from around the world for this Blue Marble webinar, in which we're going to look at one of the things that's most requested in the Blue Marble evaluation space are concrete examples of how the principles of Blue Marble evaluation apply in specific places. And so today you're going to get a look at the role of fisheries in the larger context of blue marble work that's being done in that regard. Um, and I'll introduce Glenn Page, who will introduce the presenters today in just a moment. But first, let me uh, acknowledge the context in which we are operating, the uh, global pandemic, which um, is in some way a warm up for the larger global climate emergency. Um, April distance has brought us May existence and we look forward to uh, June and onward as this unrolls. But the coronavirus epidemic is being treated now as a precursor of the larger global emergency and the widespread flatten the curve graphic that may become the most famous data visualization in evaluation history because of its influence has already been adapted to the climate, um, showing the need to flatten climate protective measures uh, in order to ensure a future that's more sustainable and equitable. Um, this cartoon from the Economist magazine shows the coronavirus and the world in a battle together with climate change looming outside, watching the preliminary round um, as we move into what comes next. And so we're already needing to attend to this. The UN Secretary General has been consistent in reminding people that the pandemic doesn't make the climate change emergency go away. It intensifies it and the importance of learning lessons about the work that's ongoing becomes ever more important. And that's what we're going to turn to today. So I'm going to, to introduce Glenn. Glenn Page is coming to us from uh, his work in as a conservation ecologist. He has been especially one of our leaders in blue marble evaluation in place-based applications, attending to the ways in which the global and the local connect around the integration principle of blue marble evaluation, the global principle of seeing across silos, working across the local to the global, and that's going to be the feature of our work today. So Glenn will introduce our presenters, and then we'll come back and have a chance to interact with your questions. Thank you all for participating, for being a part of this, and Glenn, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Michael, and thanks for your remarkable leadership and uh, reminders of the threats we face, not just in this pandemic, but uh, in terms of the really the next decade of, of challenge in terms of understanding what we need to do. So it's really with remarkable honor that I get to introduce both Kofi Agboga and Alistair Harris, two folks I've had the real honor of working with over the years and uh, both scholars, athletes, visionaries, community builders. Um, and I can't say enough for them uh, in terms of what they bring to the world. But uh, what brings them together here is the concept of small scale fisheries. And when we think of fisheries, we often think of large scale fisheries issues and sort of fishing the open sea. But Really, small-scale fisheries accounts for over 90% of the economic value that's associated with the world's commercial fishers, processors, and others employed in the seafood value chain. And one-third of all of fish that's landed comes from artisanal and subsistence fishers. Now, this is critically important because roughly 15 to 20% of global animal protein worldwide comes from artisanal and subsistence fisher, fisheries. But in some countries such as Ghana, roughly 60 to 70% of the animal protein that these folks 
actually consume comes from fisheries. So I'm gonna first introduce Kofi Agboga, who is a leader of the Yenampuano network in Ghana, and really throughout Western Africa um, in the Gulf of Guinea area, and working across small scale, semi-industrial, industrial fisheries, and really trying to understand what good governance means. And then we'll hear from Alistair Harris, who's the executive director of Blue Ventures, one of the most critically important NGOs working uh, in the world today, engaging and integrating across issues of livelihoods, of public health, conservation, and tourism. So we're really thrilled to invite both of our guests in today to talk about their work and apply the Blue Marble principles to their work. So with that, let me turn it over to Kofi, um, who leads the Yenampuano Initiative in Ghana. Thanks, Glenn, and thanks everybody for joining this webinar this afternoon. Uh, as has been introduced, my name is Kofi, and uh, I'm the executive director of Yempuano. Yempuano simply means our coast. And uh, this initiative came about uh, in 2009 when the US Agency for International Development supported a four-year initiative in the western region of Ghana. And that initiative was called the Integrated Coastal and Fisheries Governance Initiative. Uh, since the name was so long, we had to find creative ways of uh, getting a name that will resonate with our folks. And therefore, Yempuanu was born under the leadership of the Coastal Resources Center of the University of Rhode Island, together with partners like uh, Friends of the Nation Ghana and Sustainametrics that uh, Glenn Page heads, uh, and uh, World Fish from Malaysia as well, we started a very exciting project uh, in Ghana. The initiative was designed as an expression of ecosystem approach to governance. Most of the time, uh, we are looking at issues at the sectoral level, but then if you have to look at what it really means to be successful, you have to go a step beyond the sectoral approach and see how best you can integrate all the governance structures that have some part to play. Now, this project was largely engendered by the fact that uh, the Western Region coast was relatively unspoiled. And compared to the three other coastal areas in Ghana, uh, we couldn't bring about too much in the other areas. So we settled for the Western Region. At the same time, there has been oil and gas find offshore the coast, which was taught to accelerate socioeconomic and environmental change. And at that time, which was a tipping point in the history of governance here, there was the need to go in strongly, take some risks, and uh, see what are the best ways of bringing people together to learn and also transform the place where we were to work. Our initiative had emphasis on what we call learning by doing. And this was done through adaptive management, feedback loops and experimentation, as well as risk taking because we did a lot. And for us, the theory of transformation behind this was to get an understanding of the context of the place and test ways that will increase community resilience and livelihood interventions as a major feature of fisheries and coastal reforms and also, also to ensure legitimacy in all the management interventions that we profit. The cardinal in, uh, to this initiative was 
listening carefully to the people that we have to work with, that is the stakeholders, understand them and involve them in every step of the way, as well as to catalyze dialogues that brings together civil society, government, private sector, and the traditional authority, which most of the time gets lost in the governance architecture in any place because government takes over a lot. But the success of our project was to involve all these arms of governance in order that we see the light at the end of the tunnel. It also helped us to formulate practical responses to the problems and also the opportunities that are brought by accelerating social and environmental change in the Western region of Ghana. What were the governance challenges at the time? Now we have just discovered oil and gas and we were in the exploratory phase. Around West Africa, we have seen countries that have developed oil and it has become a curse to the society. So the issue is how do we manage this oil to generate long-term benefits to the people of the place? And secondly, how often unpredictable and inefficient systems of land use planning and decision making be transformed into practical and transparent ways and planning for long-term benefits of society. Again, how are human activities along the shoreline managed? And how do we minimize the impact of the coast uh, on the coast, as well as the cost to coastal erosion and anticipated increases in sea level rise? Again, the place where we are working has extraordinary biodiversity that needs to be conserved. And this same biodiversity, including the fisheries, sustain livelihoods in the area and therefore you cannot look at only one and leave the other. Our purpose was to integrate the two to see what outcomes we can have. I would like to say that managing fisheries is a very, very complex issue, especially in this part of the world because of the number of actors involved and you cannot look at fisheries management in isolation to planning of the coastal landscape and general governance of the place. Remember that uh, in fisheries management, you have the fishers, you have the women, you have the chief fishermen, you have the traditional authority, you have the private sector coming in, both at the small scale level and the large scale level and also government itself uh, looking at providing or making policies and laws that will govern the fisheries. Invariably in the past, these policies and laws were done without due consideration and regard to the involvement of small scale fishers and their leaders because they were just considered as excuse my friend, some riffraffs who just look into the sea and they don't look at what happens on land and therefore we can do anything and then uh, just drop it down to them and see how they will accept it. And this has been the practice for a very long time until we came in with some of these alternatives that uh, you cannot make rules without involving the people who will have to be affected by the rules. And that governance arrangement has to ensure sustainable fisheries. And it must also absorb shocks as they come because uh, within the fishery sector, the climate stresses are coming, oil and gas is coming, population is growing along the coast, there is overfishing, there is overcapitalization, and there is a lot of illegality. And for coastal fishers to
to be able to sustain their fisheries, all these shocks, they have to be able to uh, absorb them and adapt to the change so that uh, their livelihoods are assured. In doing this, we consider that the ecosystem is made up of the natural resources as well as human beings, their activities, and whatever they are doing in the, that impact on the environment. To respond to the change, we have to look back to see what are the key issues that has brought us to this place. What governance issues have occasioned in the past that has led to what we see today? And are there processes that are ongoing which will lead to the desired outcome? We also look into the future and try to predict how climate will impact on the small scale fisheries, especially look at the issues and see how we can work with our partners to help fishers to be able to absorb the shocks that uh, I talked about. The overarching goal of what we did was to come up with a fresh approach to coastal and fisheries management in the country. And also, how do we integrate these so that uh, we, we, we get to where we want to go? Because you cannot divorce fisheries from what happens to the coast. In this era of competition, high tourism, if people who own the land are along the coast decide to sell off all this land to investors to build uh, tourist facilities, hospitality, oil facilities, and so on, gradually they'll be pushing fishers away. So how do we strengthen the fishers and work with other governance authorities so that they are able to understand that small scale fisheries and coastal management can live side by side. Now, <clears throat> in developing our strategies, we had to look at uh, the learning cycle or the policy cycle. What are the issues? How have we profiled them? How are we preparing responses to the issues? Is there funding that will allow us to be able to go over the cliff? Will this funding be long-term or just a one-off project thing that after three or four years, it fizzles out and we leave the people dry? And how do we evaluate our own sources? Remember, most of the time, when you have projects like this, our MNE people are very strong. And under the USAID project, we had what we call the standard indicators. A number of them, how many people attended this meeting, how much money of the US government uh, funds have been spent, uh, did you achieve your target and so forth. These were very linear. If you had 20 people attending the meeting, it means you check the box. But then what happens to whether there is any learning at all? So we looked at some other outcomes that we think are positive to ensure that uh, the constituencies that we are working with are part of the process and whether they are supporting us at all or understand and believe what we were doing to help them. Do they have the sufficient capacity to implement the actions that we come up with if not, then we have to train them to be able to understand the issues and move with us in tandem. We also needed to secure the commitment of our government and other stakeholders in the project that we were implementing. And finally, we ask ourselves, how well have we defined our goals at the societal and the environmental levels. To do this, we try to come up with our own custom indicators that will tell us that we are succeeding or we are failing. 
So we ask a few questions. How are we progressing on the issues that we have profiled with our constituencies? Are we nesting the issues at the community level, district level, through to the government level? How are we doing stakeholder integration across sectors and over time? What I call the nestedness, or we call nested approach. And how are we assessing ourselves on the program, our priorities, whether we are achieving them? And at some point, we allow external evaluators to come in to look at what we have done, interface with project management, and also interface with the constituencies to ensure that uh, what we say we were going to do, besides the standard indicators that we have given, our own custom indicators, how have we been able to uh, achieve them? I'd just like to talk about some successes of what we did over the four years and how we continue to uh, use those learnings to inform what we do today. I must say that the approach we adopted and the trust of leaders across all the sectors and skills and united individuals, communities, districts, regions, and the nation as a whole. I remember at the close of our project, the senior advisor to the president who was present told the whole nation that the nation must follow the Yempuanu approach in order that we will be able to achieve successes along the coast. We made a lot of contribution in policy formulation at the National Development Planning uh, Commission level and also at the government level. And at some point in time, when you go to the Ministry of Finance, they refer to all coastal issues as Yempuanu issues. The policy inputs that we made informed the National Development Planning to redirect coastal districts, how they should be planning the coastal activities, as well as uh, looking at the small scale fisheries issues within their localities and also be involved in its management. We also try to get a support for coastal districts in terms of their planning of their policies. So we prepared a lot of toolkits, district by districts, for them to be able to look at their districts in a special manner, both looking into the marine on land so that they can improve their planning. And even the documents that they produce will be a bankable document where investors can look at and say, well, this is what these guys have in this place. This is where they are how can we come in there to invest rather than they going up to government and say we want this that that they should also be able to sell themselves and that is what we did and we supported a lot of policy development in the fishery sector which translated into the whole nation and therefore you went somewhere in other district and say why are you not bringing the yampuano issues to our side we also love to have something like that. Our overarching goal was to come up with a fresh approach to coastal management and small scale fisheries management in the country and integrate them so that uh, the land issues and the marine issues would not be looked at in isolation or in a tunnel vision manner, but rather integrate them so that each player or actor in the game is aware of what the other is doing. And this brought about a lot of transformation and the constituencies that we worked with also believed in us and began supporting us. Now, the outcome of all this is that we were able to expand the projects 
in subsequent project development to cover the whole coast and look at how the lessons that we have learned in the Western region can be applied. I am happy to inform you today that when we go to meetings, you see fishermen who hitherto, we call them riffraffs, are quoting the laws and telling government people, you are not doing this and this is how you should do it. And in that way, we get very happy that at least we have been able to transform people. We are able to take women fishmongers on national television to debate issues with chief directors and enforcement agencies as to how small scale fisheries should be run. And some of these things, I think that were very, very germane to the project. And that is what has made the Yen Puanu initiative ingrained in the minds and the hearts of the people of the Western region. And if I sit back and look at what Blue Marble is trying to do, I think that we have been able to use a lot of the principles embedded in Blue Marble. Although at the time we were doing all these things, this Blue Marble evaluation approach has not become the in thing. So I'll end here and I'll give Glenn the floor to perhaps one, ask one or two questions as well as the audience. Thank you. Very awesome. Much. Kofi, thank you. Uh, extraordinary. And just to provide a, a little bit of context, um, upon engaging with Kofi a few years ago, I, I can't tell you um, how very little was known about the system, but this team that Kofi has been leading over the years has been absolutely dedicated to understanding the context in ways that really is um, lessons to be learned about how you understand the context of a place that you have been living in, that you're from, but to see it with fresh eyes and to understand it anew, and then to begin to share that. But that learning was done through radical engagement with the communities, seeing the own place through the eyes of each other and then coming together and shaping the frame of what is possible moving forward. So there's a document that's attached that actually was a document that was um, that summarizes those early steps called Our Coast, Our Future, which is Yanampuano in the local language. Um, and it's just, talk about integration, you know, it's a key principle of Blue Marble evaluation is this integration of global thinking, of understanding the Anthropocene and the issues of the Anthropocene, the transformative engagement. And how do you integrate across those aspects? Well, this is an absolutely stellar example of a case study that has integrated those areas and is still adaptively learning. So let's now shift over to a more global initiative, but one that is equally rooted in integration across communities, sense-making, deep listening to the issues of the people of the place, and creating incredibly innovative and thoughtful ways of addressing problems that are entirely local, but are also global as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Al Harris, um, a phenomenally good coastal uh, ecologist and coral reef expert uh, but one who I think is one of the be better integrators and entrepreneurs uh, in terms of creating new ideas to vexing wicked challenges. So with that, Al, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, I think you're on mute. Thanks very much, um, Glenn. Can you see some slides that I'm... Yes, uh, I'm affirm it. I should now be presenting. Let me just uh, see if I can see them somehow. Um, yeah, we are seeing them definitely. Great. I'm afraid I'm not, so I might just, <laughs> if you just bear with me, I'll just try to stop, yeah, no problem. stop the share and then reshare.
Apologies about that. That should now work. Can you see it again? Yeah, beautiful. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to, to share with you. Um, Glenn and I go back um, now to the days of my PhD studying coral reefs and climate impacts in the Southern Red Sea. So um, it's lovely to see you again, Glenn. Um, I've spent nearly 20 years working on um, tropical small scale fisheries management and marine conservation in the Western Indian Ocean largely. Um, I'm a marine conservationist by trade, but I approach it from the perspective of, of, of small scale fisheries management because there are very few places where fishing isn't taking place and fishing is fisheries management is probably the most powerful um, lever that we have to mobilize community support for marine protection. Um, hundreds of millions of people um, depend on fisheries for food security and for livelihoods and it's in the tropics that we see most of those fishers, many of them living in low income countries and emerging economies, and many of them depending on, on, on fishing as a primary source of, of protein, micronutrients and, 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 and jobs. And so there really can't be a scalable solution to marine conservation, particularly in the tropics, which is home to most of the life in our oceans, most of the fishers, most of the production that doesn't ground itself in efforts to to address small scale fisheries management challenges and those challenges are of course incredibly severe climate change obviously today being a case in point is is, is wreaking havoc um, in so many areas of, of the tropics with unseasonably warm weather with extreme thermal stress events now affecting coral reefs almost annually with uh, accelerating cyclonic activity um, as we're seeing in the bay of bengal um, increasing dependence on small scale fisheries, increasing competition. And this is a sector that is globally very marginalized uh, and policy regimes are stacked in favor of industrial fisheries, typically in larger commercial operations that disenfranchise the needs of, of often very, very vulnerable groups um, that depend so wholly on, on, on fisheries. And conservation and, and, and food security in many of the places that we work needs to be looked at through the lens of, of hunger and how we can ensure that communities um, can continue to live with the ocean and, and, and doing so sustainably. We work, as I mentioned, in, in the tropics, which is home to the most biodiverse ecosystems on earth, but also some of the most populous regions where we see most of the fisheries dependence Blue Ventures began in, in Madagascar, and I'll share some perspectives on, and reflections on some of our work there. And we've expanded gradually over the years in, in the Western Indian Ocean and um, Southeast Asia, and to a lesser extent in, in Mesoamerica. Um, we work primarily at a local level, supporting communities with local and co-management. And we do four things. Um, the first is supporting communities to find out what's happening in the water, assessing their fisheries, using participatory approaches that produce locally owned, locally relevant data, using indicators that are meaningful for, for people. There is an incredibly powerful indicator called fishing yield or catch per unit effort or kilos of octopus in this case landed per woman, per fisher hour or per day that is a convenient proxy of, of the health of the resource and the economic returns in that, in that fishery. And we're always developing new approaches, often using mobile systems that can empower communities to have access to really strong understanding of what's happening in that fishery in space and time to guide management decision making quickly on the water. This is really participatory science, agile science in action in close to, to real time analysis. The second thing we do is, is, is governance. We're, we're heavily involved in supporting communities to use whatever framework is available to them in whatever that jurisdiction is to produce um, management that is legally watertight and so for example excluding outside actors like industrial fishing vessels and that will in, ensure that local buy-in of course that local buy-in or the absence of that is the primary reason for the failure of the overwhelming majority of marine conservation efforts around the world because they've been imposed from the outside be it by a state or by an international ngo often um, riding roughshod over the human rights of communities that will depend on the biodiversity that's in that protected area marine or terrestrial and we see a litany of examples of this throughout coastal East Africa. So the governance piece builds on that locally led marine monitoring piece. 
The third thing that we do is related to helping communities overcome some of the barriers that they face when they're when we're talking about engagement in and participation in, in, in locally led marine management. I think it's wishful thinking as a, as, a, as a conservation practitioner to assume that rebuilding fisheries alone will be enough to help lift coastal communities and small scale fisheries out of poverty. It simply isn't enough, even with the staggering rates of return that we can see when fisheries are managed really well. And by that, I mean, we can see rates of return that are faster than any financial product on the market. That's the really interest in doing this stuff. But even then, it's not enough. The pressures are so extreme, particularly with climate, particularly with growing demands on, on seafood for protein from the north. So we have to look at other interventions as conservationists. We do that through other incentive opportunities. Last November, we took at the largest um, mangrove conservation blue carbon project to the market as an opportunity to bring new revenues into communities in return for the stewardship of these ecosystems. Um, or livelihood diversification efforts, working with the sea. There are many other initiatives than one can think about on land here. This is the world's first community run sea cucumber ranch for, for lucrative sea cucumbers, um, which are exported to Asia for the aphrodisiac market. I, I, I should add that they don't actually work. Um, the, in addition to, 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 to livelihood diversification work, we also work heavily in community health um, in response to um, an expressed need from small scale fishing communities to address basic issues of community health where there is an unmet need. Now that's quite an unusual approach for a conservation organization and it comes from the approach that we bring to our work which is one of constantly analyzing and responding to the express needs of communities often resulting in programming that looks a little bit unusual um, the final area that we work in really is helping communities assert their rights secure legal access to those fishing grounds building on that framework of local governance to secure for example definitive legal protection for locally managed marine protected areas in the face of outside threats like foreign or even domestic industrial bottom trawlers. Um, when we try to encapsulate all of that within, within a theory of change, if you look at this rather messy slide on the left of the screen, um, those are the problems. It's an ecological problem that is becoming a more and more urgent humanitarian emergency. Um, existing models for marine protection aren't working and there are real barriers to grassroots approaches that we're trying to develop. Our approach in, col in, the, in the second column on the left is building those skills in, in, in marine assessment, local governance support, helping communities overcome those barriers through livelihood diversification, through health, for example, through other incentives, and then helping them secure their rights. And the end goal, of course, is, is, is marine protection, marine areas managed sustainably, effectively by communities in the long term. Now, our approach internally to evaluating what works is, is really based in our values as a community-based organization, and it all focuses on listening. This is a learning cycle that we developed internally. And what's striking to me is, is how, how much of this resembles some of the key learning from the Blue Marble approach. Um, listening to communities to help understand, to help interpret what an effective intervention might be. And very rarely does that look like anything that I would design based on the literature or based on an analysis of pre-existing interventions. If I were writing or designing a project from, from outside, I'm currently speaking today from the UK. Um, the plans that we develop are inev invariably quite pragmatic, low cost, um, low tech very often. Um, the delivery, the of that is generally locally led we'll always invest in building those local teams wherever we can and then we will be reviewing the performance of that work whether it's a livelihood intervention what is the income that that's delivering if it's a fisheries piece what is the increase in catch per unit effort that's delivering over time if it's a health program what's the impact on the contraceptive prevalence rate over that period and then of course feeding that back in to adapt the program um, when something works, and of course not everything does, we will then share that to try to encourage adoption in other contexts. But we have very much a fail fast mentality in the organization so that we're constantly trying to um, learn and share our learning. Indeed, what doesn't work is often as much as important as, as what does. I think it's fair to say that within the conservation sector, which is very much focused on communications and 
selling good ideas, there perhaps isn't enough humility and focus on the things that haven't haven't necessarily worked, those failures. Um, perhaps what does that look like on the ground? This is the, the village within which, which Blue Ventures was, was established um, in 2003. Um, at the time, I, I was a marine ecologist and I was very much focused on supporting communities to establish permanent marine reserves, areas of marine protection. The science indicated very compellingly that this site here, which you can see in this picture, this offshore barrier reef system, war, was worthy of that. It had the highest fish diversity, highest benthic cover of coral reef. A, a permanent marine reserve comprising about 30% of this, according to the science, should have been the logical intervention. Of course, that wasn't deemed socially acceptable. Um, and I really ought to have known in my naivety that that shouldn't have been a conversation that I should even have, even have started. Um, such was the sacrifice, the economic cost that was feared at that level. And it was a very real sacrifice should that area have been closed for um, in, in, in perpetuity to fishing. Um, communities then it through consultation told us and showed us that there was one fishery that was incredibly important that we hadn't studied and that was for this animal here this this reef octopus that was the most important small-scale fishery in the country it had never been studied it lives fast it dies young it grows exponentially once it's settled from the pelagic phase it would respond incredibly rapidly to management it doesn't really have any biodiversity importance it's not a species of conservation concern it's not a keystone species it was completely off the radar despite me having spent thousands of hours with colleagues in the water studying the species that were deemed important for us as, as, as conservationists. So we supported a community not to establish a permanent marine reserve, which is my initial hypothesis, um, but a temporary one just for that species, just a few hundred hectares and just for, for six months initially. And when that closure was reopened, the increase in production was absolutely staggering. Um, communities were catching more than they had in a day. They were catching more than they had in, over a period of weeks previously. Um, the average at size of the animal had absolutely soared. Um, fast forward seven years after there have been hundreds of these closures and we uh, did an analysis, a bioeconomic analysis of the return of these closures showing 90, over 92% monthly internal rates of return from, from the closures. So a staggeringly effective intervention that was designed largely by communities understanding of what the what fishery needed to be managed most quickly and adding to that our basic knowledge of the life history of the of the octopus. And that has then fed into the design of conservation interventions at scale throughout Madagascar and the broader Western Indian Ocean. Indeed, the locally managed marine area approach, the co-management approach in Madagascar is the primary entry point for marine protection, now covering over 18%, 1-8% of the island's inshore seabed, and the overwhelming majority of them having been catalyzed by this approach that wasn't brought in by academia or outside experts, but came from that process of consultation and listening to two communities. And that same learning cycle has informed the development of our programming in Madagascar and elsewhere. I mentioned sea cucumber farms, blue carbon projects, integrated community health programs. And the result, of course, is, is, is a very integrated, holistic programming intervention that is very, very difficult to evaluate as a whole and as a holistic intervention. And that it's also, I should add, as a conservationist, it's quite difficult to fund that kind of work in a, in a climate when people are looking for silver bullets. What's the outcome been from a conservation perspective? We got a paper published just last week that showed really for the first time definitive evidence of increasing resident fish biomass within permanent marine reserves that have been established by those communities in Madagascar. Um, Importantly, those reserves only came about once that governance, once that support, once that engagement for marine protection had been introduced as a result of all of the above. This was the initial proposition that I made 20 years ago, but it only came about once those initial um, needs had been met and once that local participation effectively had been unlocked. Um, so the lesson for us really has been that this it is this integrated approach that's recognizing unmet needs at a grassroots level that is so foundational to a durable um, lasting conservation legacy. Um, I've said a lot I should probably pause there for, for some questions. <laughs> Glenn. Oh my gosh amazing and um, 
so I inserted also the strategic vision of Blue Ventures. And if you have a chance, and I, that and the original Yenampano founding documents that guides their vision, these are two remarkable uh, organizations that the world needs to pay attention to. And as, as both are describing, it's about building these enabling conditions that is rooted in deep listening. And as, as, as Al just said, these are not the kind of things that are written up necessarily in the literature. So we have got to figure this out in a way that's applicable at a local scale and scaled at a more global scale. So let's go to some of the questions and thank you all. If you do have questions, put them in the chat box. Let's see um, how much we can get through. So this is one from Dr. Um, Sana Elanawi, um, and it's really a question around the resources needed for the kind of policy changes that you're both seeking. So let's go to Kofi. Um, what, what are the sort of resources that are needed to keep the momentum going for the kind of transformative uh, changes that you're seeking in this, in this work? Thank you very much, Glenn and uh, Dr. Sana. I want to say that this is a very difficult area because uh, if you look at our learning cycle or the project cycle, it goes about in loops and you start small and uh, learn, evaluate, and then go over the cycle again. And at this time, the loops will be growing bigger in size and all this uh, has to be funded. So in your first uh, cycle, if you secure government commitment, then you begin to work with government to provide funds besides what the donors are giving us as uh, NGOs. As you know, we always put up proposals and go out there to look for funds to do something very creative. But once you receive government commitment, you are sure that uh, some of the issues that you have profiled that needs addressing, government will very much try to put something in there. We have been pushing our governments, for instance, that in the fishery sector, the percentage of GDP that is uh, plowed back into fisheries management is very, very low. And that there is need to increase funding in that aspect. Gradually, as they begin to commit to the process, uh, there'll be more funding. If it is not coming to the NGOs, at least they channel it into their ministries, department of agencies to support the work that we do together. Invariably, they now accept us the NGOs as partners in development and therefore uh, sometimes they support what we do together and we also commit some funding that we receive from elsewhere to be able to uh, learn more and improve the livelihood of all. So that is what I would say to this question and uh, I hope that uh, it answers partially your question. I know it is not easy to get our own governments to put more funding into these policy issues, but uh, I'm sure with time we'll get there. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, Kofi. And Alistair, how about you? How about the challenge of making the case for this kind of transformative work that is truly long-term? I mean, you just described a 20-year time horizon for a conservation outcome that's essential, but Without those 20 years, you never would have achieved that. How do you make that case to, um, to the funding community? Uh, through, through evidence of impact, I think, is the most powerful way to make that case. The data that I just referred to, for example, showing the, the, the value and the, 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 the outcomes of community conservation haven't been shown from any of the top-down approaches anywhere in the region, certainly not in, in Madagascar or Mozambique or Tanzania. So these are, you know, there is compelling evidence underpinning this work. Um, I was struck by a question that's just come up under, in, 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 the, in the chat. Um, what would you please speak to if how the monitoring and evaluation of your programs has been scaled 
I think what, what, what perhaps I didn't convey this 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 adequately, but M and E for us is not a retrospective bolt on that is done periodically. It is this one of the central value propositions. It is the democratization of data. It's putting those data in a meaningful format using da dashboards that mean something to the stewards of that resource to guide that conversation on the ground. There is nothing more powerful than that. Our original theory of change used to be that if we could de demonstrate a return on a fisheries management intervention, a short-term short surge in, in, in catch yields, that would change behavior on the water. And indeed it did, but it was a very short-sighted assumption. We were seeing similar catalysis of behavior change even when management had failed. And we still see that even in fisheries that, that recover more slowly. And we believe that that was because of the power of these data that are guiding those decision making, that decision making on the ground. That's also hugely influential at a na national scale, for example, in putting these fisheries on the radar of national, national governments who might not recognize that this system, systemic underreporting of, of, of small scale fisheries catches. And so data are power in, 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 in this discourse. And so um, grounding our entire value proposition in data has been has been fundamental to, to to being able to take this work to scale the other dimension i touch on on scale is that we cannot scale up quickly enough if we're relying on this conventional ingo expansion model incrementalism is frankly denialism when we're dealing with an extinction emergency and perhaps a generation left remaining before coral reefs become chemically and thermally unviable. We have to invest boldly, and by that I mean in a, in a truly unrestricted way, in building grassroots local civil society in the, in the context in which, which we're operating. COVID-19 has put that reality into stark relief, showing the dysfunction of this north-south um, power dynamic within the INGO and particularly the conservation space. It's, it's, it's shown how unprepared we were to, um, to build that civil society capacity on the ground. And so for us, scale is, is, is scaling ideas and not our own work. Oh, it's critical. And in fact, I think what we need to do is have a focused webinar just on that topic alone around those inequities. Um, so there's a question from Ronald Denis um, around uh, gender and both programs have, I know, have intentionally and focused, uh, demonstrated gender transformative practices. And so the question is, how have you demonstrated the gender transformative practices in programming and evaluation studies or assessments? And do you have some evidence, samples or studies to share? Uh, let's begin with you, Kofi. Thank you very much. I think in my discourse, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, through our engagement, we are now able to even get fishmongers to come and sit on television to engage uh, law enforcement agencies, top policy makers within the ministries on issues regarding women and fisheries. Uh, in our work, we started with engaging women fishmongers who took us through a lot how they are able to move fish from one landing beach to a location all the way in, say, Burkina Faso or Niger. We didn't know about this. Those days, they used to sit in the bus with the fish all the way to those areas. But today, with technology, they are able to just put the fish on a truck and uh, it goes right to the person that uh, they want to receive at the under, other end of the world. And they get their monies through either mobile money or bank transfers or things. So it reduces the risk. We have endeavored to mainstream gender in all the things that we have done. I want to say that uh, in the small scale fisheries, for instance, whilst working in the Western region, the women caucus were not very much heard. We were able to negotiate to get women to serve on the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen's Council and be part of their executive because we realized that the women's needs and voices must also be heard. We have uh, done a lot of gender analysis 
which we have shared with government and even women. Out of all this, the government also supported the women's group now to form the National Fish Processors Association, which is a very powerful group now and has over 30,000 membership across the country. So the women, the women's card or the women's issues are now coming up uh, thick and fast. And we need to continue working with them so that uh, they get the direction of how to also understand all the issues related to the fisheries. Let me underscore the fact that uh, most of the fishery activities that you see going on in our coastal areas are funded by women. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are very, very, very instrumental in whether we have fish at the market, fish in our homes or fish on the table, and we cannot wish them away. So we have worked with women extensively to be able to get them up the totem pole so that they are able to make contributions as to how fishery is managed in the country. Excellent. Thank you, Kofi. And if you could send the, any of those gender analysis reports to me, I'll make sure that they go up on the website um, so if people are interested. And um, I, we've come to the actually the end of our, of our allotted time, so I'm going to turn it over to Michael um, to bring us home and um, provide a final word. Well, I think that um, Alistair has given us the final word. Um, incrementalism is denialism. And that sums up the situation that uh, we're in as, as well as any and the need to, to integrate uh, what we're doing with the, with the big picture. And, and both, of, both of you, uh, tremendous presentations, tremendously important, good, solid, concrete case examples of blue marble principles. Um, that's what people are searching. Uh, Glenn, we've got one minute for you to mention upcoming events. Um, why don't you do that? And we'll welcome you all back here for future activities. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Kofi and Alistair. I mean, remarkable. This is what it's all about. It's the local, real, wicked issues that we need to, we need to address with creative, innovative, learn-by-doing approaches and challenge the status quo. So you are both exemplars and true um, bricolores of doing this work. So thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, and just to say the next one, next um, event is gonna be on, the next Blue Marble webinar is on uh, June 16th. And that's gonna be at, um, I think it's 2 p.m. Eastern, um, and that'll be 7 p.m. UK time. And we're gonna have uh, presentations from Isabel Carlisle on South Devon. Um, which will be really wonderful around bioregional thinking and the application of blue marble principles, as well as um, Dr. Edward Mueller um, from Costa Rica, who's creating a regenerative roadmap for the country of Costa Rica, applying a blue marble lens. So stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for on the um, blue marble website for that information. And with that, I just want to say thank you all for joining and particularly uh, Kofi and Alistair, thank you guys so much. You are true exemplars of what it means to practice in this time of great challenge, both with the current pandemic and global systems change all around us. So with that, thank you all very much. <laughs>